morning, good morning. Um, it's good to be here. Today begins a day of another trip with Rick Bonfin Ministries. There's a group that's flying out tonight, and they're going to be in Brazil for 11, 12 days. They have churches lined up, and man, the Lord's really going to move there. Um, I can't wait to hear the stories. That's one of the that's one of the best things about working here is uh, you just get to hear the stories when they come back from these trips. And I've gotten to go on a couple trips. I went to Cuba, went to Israel. I haven't been to Brazil yet. Maybe my day will come. But, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's just really cool to see what the Lord does. I don't know how it works, but as we begin, as we continue to give ourselves and to do what we do here, the Lord blesses people. And the ministry just keeps rolling. Um, so, amen, Allison. Me and Allison are here this morning doing Bible study. And it's a pleasure to be here with you. So let's pray for the group as they're going to fly out tonight. And um, we got a lot. Allison and I, are, are we're going to be working in the office while they're gone. And, man, we got stuff to do. We got two weeks of work with Rekindle coming up. And there is so much to do, and uh, just pray for us that we can get the job done that needs to be done. Amen? God, we pray for this group. God, would you be the wind under the wings of that plane, and would you get them all there safely? God, we pray for each one right now in their minds and in their emotions, any way that the devil is trying to distract, discourage, come against and we just stand in the gap there and pray, Lord Jesus, that each member of this team and that Rick and Betty will be covered in the shadow of your wings, Lord Jesus. We pray, God, that you would prepare in them to receive what you have from them there in Brazil. Prepare these churches, Lord God, the hearts of the people to receive. God, we know that you're going to do unbelievable things there and so we just thank you in advance for the work that you're doing in these lives. And uh, God, we pray for me and Allison as we've got to get the work done here. Lord, that you would give us wisdom to see problems even before they come so that we wouldn't get stumped and we would get hung up on things. But Lord, we would just get the work done because there's so much to do to get ready for Rekindle. And we need you, God, in this office, your spirit to be here, guiding us, giving us focus and direction and discernment and wisdom into every project, every task. So help us, God. We love you, Jesus. Give us a word this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, we are continuing our focus on the cross. And uh, we've kind of been hitting a little bit of a different area every day. And it's pretty amazing. We talked about, yesterday we talked about Matthew chapter 10. And Jesus is talking about how you have to take up your cross daily because those who are ashamed of me on earth, I'll be ashamed of them in heaven. In other words, and then he talks about family. So the cross in that situation Jesus is saying, listen, I'm going to challenge your strongest commitments. What are you going to be most committed to? The people around you or your Father in heaven? Even unto death, the cross. And that's what uh, the cross represents, total obedience and submission to God. And that's what I talked about a couple days ago, Philippians chapter 2. And how that was the secret to Jesus' ministry was that he was totally humbled before God to say, I'll do whatever you want me to do, and I don't care how crazy it makes me look in the eyes of these people, I will do what you call me to do, God. And that's, that was the secret to Jesus' ministry, to the Holy Spirit being activated in his ministry, was that he was totally abandoned. As Rick says, kamikaze, right? Whatever you want me to do, God, I'll do it. And the cross... Does it make any sense, really? A dying Savior? Come on. But Jesus was vindicated and exalted. So you see, the honor 
and respect that the Father gave for Jesus was because Jesus was totally submitted and humble before God. And uh, what else did we talk about? Isaiah 50. I wasn't there for that one. Allison, fill us in on Isaiah 53. I'm going to give the mic to Allison and she can remind us of what Betty talked about there. Betty talked about Isaiah 53 and how um, it's a prophecy. It was a prophecy from Isaiah and how it, it had to have pointed to Jesus and it was just talked about how rejected and despised and um, stricken, they they counted him as stricken, and how they would just really rejected Jesus, his life here on earth, and um, and that kind of ties into how since he did humble himself for those thirty so years, that's why he's the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. <laughs> so it was really good. Yeah. Man, count on Betty to bring in a little a little bit of the Old Testament. You know, that's what I love about Betty, man. She knows how to tie the two together really well. Um, and uh, But that's right. It's a, a rejected Savior. I mean, he's just totally misunderstood, right? And he's our example. And he took our place. He took it. Yes. He took the sin for himself, right? Yeah, he took it on the cross. Um, I talked about, oh yeah, that ties into Romans 5. I'm doing a little review for you in case you didn't know. Because we've been talking, I don't want you to forget what we've talked about. I'm trying to, we're trying to fill in the cross for you. So Romans chapter 5, I talked about how in that section Paul is saying everyone was on the Adam track of life. In other words, fallen from God, sin prevailed, and death through sin and it was just a bad situation, the Adam track. And then Jesus comes, born a human being, born on the Adam track. He was tempted just as we were tempted, but unlike us, was without sin. And so on the cross, took on a punishment he did not deserve. And so thus ended the Adam track. And so Jesus, so Adam is one head. And Jesus is the new, a second Adam, so to speak, right? I think Paul mentions it, so he uses that phrase at some point. A second Adam. Jesus is a second Adam. And, and so we could start on the Jesus track, where we're no longer on the Adam track where sin and death prevail. We're on the Jesus track where we have life and victory. So Jesus cuts off that Adam track and puts us in a new place under a new Adam where we have a new beginning and a new start. That's Romans chapter 5. I talked about that. And then Rick and I have been having some fun uh, interactions in the morning. Allison and I might do that one time while while they're gone. You're not looking forward to that, are you, Allison? <laughs> so this morning, what am I going to talk about? Well, I've already taken up about half my time just rambling. But I thought that was a good review. Just you know, we've we've kind of gone for a week and a half or so. We've had several Bible studies on the cross. I thought it would be helpful just to have a little review about all the different areas, because I want you to see, and I'm flipping to Hebrews, by the way, if you wanted to know, I want you to see how much you can talk about the cross. You know, we talk about Jesus died on the cross. Well, what does that mean? Well, it means all these things we've been talking about, and even more, we're going to keep going on, on the cross of Jesus Christ, and just hitting and highlighting some different, some different areas in the scriptures about what does that mean? Filling it in, giving it some foundation, some meat to that idea of the cross and what it means for us. Okay. There's the concept of the covenant. And it's a concept that was established in the Old Testament. Now, a covenant was not... Um, exclusive to Israel or an exchange between God and Israel in the Old Testament. A covenant was a very common practice during that time, during that time period. 
called a suzerain vassal covenant. Oh, Lord Jesus. Essentially, what would happen is you would have a strong kingdom and a weak kingdom. And the strong kingdom would go to the weak kingdom and say, listen, I'm not going to totally wipe out and destroy all your people and your land, but I'll make a covenant. In other words, a deal with you. The deal is you pay tribute to me, you give me money, and you provide troops if I need uh, support in a military campaign. In exchange, I offer you protection. If another tribe or small kingdom comes and starts to try to attack you on this border, I'll send my troops over there and I'll take care of you. Okay? So it's a suzerain vassal covenant. It's a very, very common practice in the day. Well, we see in Genesis chapter, uh, you know, I never can remember if it's 13, 14, or 15, with Abraham. The story of Abraham begins in 12, but it's not until 15 is where it is, right? Where God makes a covenant with Abraham. Now, I just want you to know, I've got 20 minutes, I've got 18 minutes to tie this back into the cross. <laughs> so let's see if I can do it. Because I'm all the way in Genesis chapter 15. And I've got to tie it all the way into the cross. But I'll get there, don't worry. We're trying to give some meat to this idea of the cross. And we'll, go, we'll get back to Hebrews. Don't worry. Okay. So then, I'm just getting my bearings here of where I want to start, because it's kind of long, so I think we can cut it short a little bit. Verse 7, all right, verses 1 through 6, the Lord promises to Abraham that he'll give him a child to be his heir, okay, because Abraham and his wife Sarah haven't had children yet. So then verse 7, God says, he also said to him, I'm the Lord who brought you out of Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to take possession of it. What land? Land of Canaan, where, the, um, where Israel is right now. Okay. But Abram said, Sovereign Lord, how can I know that I, will that I will gain possession of it? So the Lord said to him, Bring me a heifer, a goat, and a ram, each three years old, along with a dove and a young pigeon. So Abram brought all these to him, cut them in two, and arranged the halves opposite each other. This is a common practice. Uh, let me see if I have a note here uh, about this. The NIV, NIV doesn't have a note, but it's a common practice. That was how you made the covenant, is you took an animal, you cut it in two, you put one, one on one side and one on the other, and then you walked through it. Okay, so Abr Abraham comes out, or Abram at this point, hadn't changed his name, put... Puts these animals in two and puts one side on the other. Then Abram's sitting out there for a long time because it says, Then the birds of prey came down on the carcasses. So they're sitting out there for a while. Abram's just hanging out with some dead animals cut in half. I mean, talk about crazy looking. Yeah. I mean, honestly, he's out in the field with some dead animals cut in half. Just sitting there waiting. He doesn't know what he's waiting for. Now, that's faith, okay? I just want to point that out. That's a faith thing. He's just waiting on the Lord. Okay, and Abram drove them away. As the sun was setting, so around dusk time, Abram fell into a deep sleep, and a thick and dreadful darkness came over him. Then the Lord said to him, Know for certain that your descendants will be strangers in a country not their own, and they will be enslaved and mistreated 400 years. But I will punish the nation they serve as slaves, and afterward they will come out with great possessions. You, however, will go to your fathers in peace and be buried at, the, at a good old age. In the fourth generation, your descendants will come back here for the sin of the Amorites has not yet reached its f full measure. So God is saying, he's speaking of the Egyptian enslavement 
And then Moses leads them out and brings them into the promise. And eventually Joshua leads them across the river. Do y'all remember that? You know what I'm talking about? Okay. So when the sun had set and darkness had fallen, a smoking fire pot with a blazing torch appeared and passed between the pieces. On that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram and said, To your descendants, I give this land. From the river of Egypt to the great river of the Euphrates, the land of the Kenites, Kenizzites, Cadmonites, Hittites, Perizzites, Raphites, Amorites, Canaanites, Girgashites, and Jebusites. Sites, 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 sites. I guess we should be the Americanites. <laughs> nah, I made a, got a little crack out of Allison on that one. What's the point here? God made a covenant with Abram that he would be with him forever. And and his descendants would remain forever. Now, what does it mean for God to be? Now, Abram is the vassal, and God is the Suzerian. Suzerian vassal. Yes, Suzerian. As in, God is the stronger, Abram's the weaker. God makes a covenant with Abraham. Right? What does that mean? Well, that means... That God is now in the position of providing a way for Abram and his descendants to be cared for. I hope you just got that. That back in Genesis 15, way before Jesus, God said, I'm going to make a covenant with you. I'll be for you and all your descendants. I'll be your Suzerian, I'll be the stronger who provides a way of protection and deliverance for you in a time of need. Now that's pretty, that's good news, people. I don't know what else to say. That is good news. So let's fast forward to Jesus. Hey, I told you I'd get there. Only took me five minutes to explain the covenant thing. Pretty good. Man, that seminary's paying off. (laughs) Well, let's go flip over. So So how does God do it? Well, the most powerful thing about that whole this whole idea to me is that God knew, God knew the greatest enemy of humanity even before he made that covenant, that it was death itself. So, God knew he was going to have to figure out a way to rescue his people, Abraham and his descendants, from death going to have to defeat death somehow, some way. Well, God makes another covenant with Israel. Later, through Moses, gives the Ten Commandments, right? And then sets up all the rituals of doing the, you know, killing the animals on the altar, sprinkling the blood, and all this stuff, Right? In other words, God sets up the idea that a second covenant with the people of Israel, that the blood of these animals is going to cover over sin and death. But then, but God knew that that wasn't going to fully deliver from death. So God has got to figure out a way to completely wipe away sin. It's a difference between, uh, what are the words? It's good seminary words. Propitiation. Huh? And expiation. Allison, would you like to tell us what those words mean? Oh, Allison would like to listen. Propitiation means cover over. And that's the Old Testament. Okay. God has got to figure out a way, because he's set himself up as the stronger. He's got to, he's got to figure out a way to rescue his people from, from this enemy of death. Well, propitiation 
is covering over. So the sacrifice, the sacrificial system set up in the Old Testament covered over sin. It just covered it. But to really be set free, God has got to expiate, as in root out. Dig it out, actually take it out, remove it. And so that's where Jesus comes in. And that's where um, Hebrews comes in. We're going to start Hebrews chapter 9. And we're going to start with verse 11. When Christ came as a high priest of the good things that are already here, he went through the greater and more perfect tabernacle that is not man-made, that is to say, not a part of this creation. And then verse 12. He did not enter by means of the blood of goats and calves. In other words, the high priests of the Israelites do the sacrifice thing, go into the most holy place, offer sacrifice for the sins of Israel to cover over. And what the author is saying is that Jesus did not go in by the blood of goats and calves, but he entered the most holy place once for all by his own blood. Having obtained eternal redemption, the blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of a heifer sprinkled on those who are ceremonially unclean sanctify them so that they are outwardly clean, Propitiation, covering over, outwardly clean. How much more then will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself unblemished to God, cleanse our conscience from acts that lead to death so that we may serve the living God? For this reason, Christ is the mediator of a new covenant, a covenant that does not just cover, cover over, but expiates roots out that those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance now that he has died as a ransom to set them free from the sins committed under the first covenant so i hope that all of the background i've given is giving some meat to this verse the Old Covenant, by the, by the death and blood of goat, goats and bulls, the priests were made ceremonially clean on the outside. They would literally, once a year, the high priest would literally cover his, put blood on his robes before he went into the most holy place to symbolize the cleansing. The, the death of those goats and bulls symbolizes that they died in our place, in the place of the Israelites, because they've broken God's covenant, and they, they have sin. <clears throat> but it's outward. It says it right here. It's, it's outward. It's a propitiation. just covers over the sin. So Hebrews 9, the author says, Jesus has come by his own blood to be a perfect sacrifice on the cross. Back to the cross. Thank you, Jesus. Finally tied it in. And on that cross, he was an eternal sacrifice entering the most holy place once and for all so that our consciences are clean, our inner minds, our hearts are clean because of Jesus. Not just outwardly anymore. He's talking about conscience, who you are on the inside is clean, washed clean by the blood of Jesus who has established a new covenant. Mediator of a new covenant, those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance. Once and for all, now that he has died as a ransom to set them free from the sins committed under the first covenant. So this idea of covenant and the cross go hand in hand. That's the point I'm trying to make. Do you see it? Please tell me, give me a nod, Allison, if you see it. Because, Okay, so I'm making a little bit of sense here. And it's actually a really powerful thing to understand about God and the fact that he initiates this covenant with Abraham to say, okay, 
I'm going to find a way. I'm, I'm setting myself up as the one who is going to deliver you, deliver you and your descendants. I, I am taking the initiative, taking it upon myself that I have to provide for you some way, somehow. Then he sets up the old covenant through Moses. And that was a covenant that covered over sin. But Jesus comes and says, I am a new covenant. And by my blood that was shed on the cross for the sins of many, there's a new covenant that offers eternal salvation that expiates sin, roots it out, giving you a clean conscience so that you can come before, before God with confidence. <coughs> Let's skip on. Uh, the author here fills this in some more, but let's skip over to 10, chapter 10, verse 19. Therefore, brother, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way opened up, opened for us through the curtain, that is his body, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful. He who promised, as in he who said to Abraham, I will make a way. I'm going to, I am committing myself to you and your descendants, Abraham. I'm going to make a way for this to work. And the author is saying, he who promised that is faithful to do it. And he did it through Jesus on the cross. Fulfilled that covenant, expiating sin destroying death on our behalf, providing a way for us to come to God now with a clean conscience in full assurance of faith that he has been faithful to us and done what he said he was going to do. Man, that's pretty good. That'll preach, y'all. I mean, come on. I could talk an hour about this. I'm almost out of time. But that's pretty good. I hope you can see that today. I hope you know that that's true for your life. I want you to see that twice the author's talked about a clean conscience. And there's nothing that makes me more sad than a Christian who beats himself up over sin every day. That's my problem with the Baptists. If you've listened to me teach long enough, you know that already. I love the Baptist. Man, they got passion, okay? I'm not, I mean, they love Jesus a lot. But man, my experience with Baptists, at least Southern Baptists, is that they beat themselves up over sin to the point that they're ineffective and they're so caught up in the fact that they're imperfect that they just can't get over themselves and, and just let the blood of Jesus cleanse them and Man, they need the Holy Spirit to activate that truth in their lives. Bam! So if, if you're dying for that today, for the Holy Spirit to come in and testify that, that you have a clean conscience before God, that you can go before God in full assurance of faith, having confidence in the blood of Jesus that was shed on the cross, let's pray for that right now today. Dear Jesus, anyone listening to this right now who needs to know that they have a clean conscience, that God is not looking down upon judgment, that the righteousness of Christ has come into their lives, and they, they need the Holy Spirit to just come in and woof, give them that confidence, give them that assurance, set them free from condemnation. God, would you come and witness within them right now that they are a child of God? Witness to their spirit, Lord Jesus. Give them that clean conscience so that, like Paul, they can say, I know I'm not innocent. I know I'm not innocent, but my conscience is clean because of the blood of Jesus. Holy Spirit, would you do that work in them today by the power of God? Do it, Lord Jesus. 
We love you, God. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for listening this morning. I hope you got a little more filled in about the cross and what it means for us and how through the cross, God came through and fulfilled that covenant promise he gave to Abraham that he was going to be committed to him and his descendants no matter what. And, it, and it was, he was taking it upon himself to deliver them from their enemies. Our greatest enemy is death. And Jesus defeated death on the cross because a man who had no sin gave himself willingly to death, defeating death on our behalf. Thank you, Jesus, for the cross. Amen. Have a great day. We'll see you tomorrow morning, 